right there is fairly obvious. There are cameras uh, that are just swiveling around, uh, looking at people, then going to the next face and the next face. So uh, the face is burnt uh, from from the explosion. We are watched twenty four seven as as a prisoner, as somebody in a in a camp. Kids are playing at night, uh, but these kids they would hear the drones and it made no difference. They kept playing. They would hear the jets. It made no difference. They would keep playing. The history of the Palestinian people from the time of the Nakba and on, this is the worst they've ever had it. What was most inspirational for me were these physicians who said, we're not going anywhere. We will die here, but we will die taking care of our people uh, with the abilities that we have. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabih. Wa man ihtada bi hadihi wa astanna bi sunnatihi ila yawmidin amma ba'd. Welcome everyone to another Project Ihiya podcast. I'm your host Asad Khan uh, with Hafiz Mus'ab. Uh, and alhamdulillah today we have a extremely an extremely important guest, Dr. Maulana Mateen Khan. Uh, Maulana, welcome to the podcast. Shukran, jazakallah khair. Happy to be here. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullah. So, Maulana Dr. Mateen Khan, our guest today, was born and raised in Pennsylvania. He completed undergraduate and medical studies at Temple University. After completing his residency in emergency medicine, he undertook alamiya studies at Darul Ulum Madaniya and Canada. Thereafter, he moved to and currently resides in central Jersey, where he practices emergency medicine part-time. With the rest of his time, he teaches the Islamic sciences, conducts halaqat, and researches issues in the contemporary practice of medicine and Islam. Um, the Ummah is going through a very painful time right now, and our brothers and sisters in Palestine, and especially in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, face a situation that can only be described uh, as a genocide to an honest observer. Uh, even global bodies and courts have attested to the plausibility of genocide, uh, by their, we can say, stringent yet unsettling standards. The merciless assault by one of the world's most technologically advanced uh, armies in the world reminds us of a verse in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That verily, when kings, powerful entities, powerful kings, enter a city, they lay it to ruin and humiliate its people of honor. Now, most Muslims want to help in some way, but very few have had the opportunity that our guest today has had in directly helping out our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine. Uh, Maulana Dr. Mateen Khan recently came back from Gaza where he served alongside a team of doctors. And inshallah, in today's interview, we hope to engage with and learn from our beloved guest about his noble trip. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> so I just wanted to welcome you, Molana Mateen, and uh, start the conversation off with uh, uh, a first question. Um, can you please walk us through the initial uh, decision-making process and the mechanics of your trip to Gaza? Sure, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. It's pretty simple, meaning I don't want to overcomplicate it. It wasn't a long thought out process. The opportunity presented itself to me. One of my good friends uh, uh, in Canada made a connection with one of the NGOs who takes doctors. He told me about it, asked me if I'd like to come. And pretty much on the spot, I said yes. And the reason being is that we have seen the Ummah do many things, many beneficial things, uh, especially in, in North America, trying to do what we can for our beloved brothers and sisters in Palestine. But this was an opportunity where perhaps with everything else, we could say that the benefit was limited, but here is an opportunity where I felt that I could do more than what we have been doing, and I could do it in a capacity that I've been trained to do it. I've always seen medicine, uh, and in many ways, alamiyah as well as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is a an opportunity Allah has given me and others. And with that opportunity, with that blessing comes a responsibility. So when the opportunity presented itself to assist in uh, through some of the things that Allah has given me, then there wasn't a way for me to say no. I felt it was the most 
impactful thing that I could do. And so it was pretty much a, a yes on the spot. After that, it was just sort of figuring out the logistics and, and everything that came uh, along with it. So when the opportunity presented, I, I agreed to it and then made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, make uh, our intentions uh, clear uh, and sincere and to give us this opportunity because without making it into a long drawn out answer, this was something that every step of the way, and there were multiple steps that we had to go through, and any of those steps could have halted us from getting to where we wanted to get to, and the opportunity could have been taken away from us. So immediately, you know, as the Prophet Sallallahu told us, that إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ That your intentions, your actions are re rewarded according to their intentions. So immediately, we made the intention that we want to go, made the dua, Ya Allah, allow us to go. And then after that, it was just a matter of waiting as we went through all the processes and steps to, to get there. Yeah, I think a lot of this question came from a place of, because a lot of people we've heard that it's very difficult to actually get into Gaza and almost impossible for anything to get out of Gaza. So kind of like the mechanics, when we were asking about the mechanics, especially it's, you know, um, was there a process? Do you sign up for it? And then, you know, how are you vetted and all of that? It was, are, are, is that just a long drawn out process or? Um... No, it, it is true. It is near impossible to get in and even more difficult to get out. Uh, currently, NGOs, non-government organizations that have connections with the UN and uh, Philistine, particularly those who have been there from the beginning, uh, do have a process by which they can be vetted and the UN can allow them to cut in, come in. But even among those, there's basically two types of people that can get in, those people who are directly involved in the administration and work of NGOs, and then physicians as well. So wow. this is sort of a, a backdoor for people to get into. Uh, now, as far as the vetting process goes, in order for us to be approved, we had to be approved, one, by the Egyptian government, because we have to cross the Rafah crossing, which means we have to go through Egypt. We have to be approved by the UN, WHO as well. And then we have to be approved by the Palestinian government as we cross into the border. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have to be approved by the Israeli government itself. Mm -hmm. This process actually doesn't take that long. The organization that we work with and uh, is the organization is called GLIA, actually based in uh, Ontario. Uh, they managed to get this process done pretty quickly for us, alhamdulillah. So do they reject a lot of people also, or is it? As far as I know, or as far as I was told, I don't know how many have been rejected, but I know that along the way, the Egyptians have stopped people, have rejected them, uh, particularly those that speak out uh, against the government. Uh, the Israelis have rejected people as well, uh, and, uh, and the UN has as well, generally based upon what uh, prior activities, certifications, other things that they've done in the past. One uh, one question I had is at the uh, Rafah border, since it's uh, Egypt and Palestine, how come Israel has to give uh, permission? I guess what standing do they have in that area? Well, Israel con controls all of the borders uh, of, of Gaza. Uh, even on the Egyptian side, they control that. Now, I'm not quite sure if that's an agreement between, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's an agreement between them and Egypt. Uh, interesting thing, when we did cross the border, there are no Israelis there. In fact, throughout my entire trip, I did not meet a single Israeli. Yeah. When you get to Rafah crossing, the Egyptians are on one side, the Palestinians on the other side. The Egypt, the Israeli involvement at that border is completely through uh, cameras. So there's cameras. They're constantly watching everyone going in and out. As you sit there waiting for your visa, uh, they're watching you as well. So wow. it's not even a physical presence. It's like there is cameras and stuff, huh? Somehow. Correct. There's no physical Israeli presence at the Rafah crossing that we went through. So then how is it enforced? I don't know. Meaning I assume there's some agreement between the yeah. governments, but I I don't know exactly how that takes place. I'm there that we didn't have to deal with them. So. And is this something that's just obvious? Or are you told like, hey, you're being watched? So we were told beforehand that you're being watched. And then when you get there, it's fairly obvious. There are cameras. Uh, that are just swiveling around, uh, looking at people, then going to the next face and the next face. So it, it's fairly obvious that you're being watched while you're there. Wow. And when you went uh, from Egypt, I guess once you landed, 
uh, what was your, you know, do you just kind of get your own transportation up until the border? Because I know the, I think the Sinai area is also pretty like, uh, like you can't just go there. Yeah, it's actually interesting. When we landed in, in Cairo, mm -hmm. we still had a few days. In fact, the Israeli government delayed our acceptance initially. So we ended up going in two days later than we accepted, oh. expected. So we landed on a Friday. I'm sorry, I left on a Friday from JFK, landed on Saturday in Cairo. We were expecting to go in two days later. And before you go in, you have to attend a mandatory UNWHO meeting where they basically tell you about, they just want you to know that you're going into a war zone and the risks that are involved in that. So you have this mandatory meeting on the day before you go in. So landed on a Saturday, Sunday, mandatory meeting. Monday was supposed to be the crossing into Rafah. Israel delayed us for two days, so we didn't actually go in till Wednesday. During the, I mean, those two days actually turned out to be very beneficial. It gave us the opportunity to scour Cairo, find, uh, purchase medications, equipment for hospitals, whatever we could get our hands on, <clears throat> put them into suitcases and bring them along with us. So that was very beneficial. Uh, and then as you uh, spoke about from Cairo to the Rafah crossing, there is the Sinai Peninsula. The Sinai Peninsula is mostly just desert. There are some towns here and there, but it's mostly just desert, but it is heavily uh, military uh, presence in that Sinai Peninsula. So as you go through, even though it probably was a couple hundred miles, if that, uh, we, were, we went through, I think, almost nine different crossings, uh, checkpoints, sorry, nine different checkpoints where we had to stop, speak to e Egyptian military, tell them what we were doing, uh, to continue before we even got to the Rafah border. That process took an entire day. Has that always been that militarized, uh, you know, with the internal strife, or is this something that's uh, related to the current situation on, you know, past the border? From what I had understood, ever since Israel took the Sinai and then gave it back, hmm. uh, Egypt has maintained that presence there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you know, <clears throat> mashallah, this is a... Uh, it's a very bold and, um, you know, a very brave step, many would describe it as, um, to in, in this situation to go, especially um, knowing what has happened to even uh, UN workers and, and so on and so forth. Um, so one thing is that's commendable, but I don't know, I don't want to get too personal, but uh, how was, uh, you know, it, it's also like a, a, the support system, like your family had to have supported you, uh, everyone back home. So uh however comfortable you are speaking to that yeah i i mean first is a personal decision and as from a personal decision i, I don't just speak for myself i speak for those who went with me and, and i'm sure those who are going uh, otherwise and continue to go even till this day and will be going in the future is that you know the belief uh, our aqidah is that when your time comes your time comes right your death is is destined whether you die here or you die there, there's no running from it. So with that, with that yaqeen that we have in that, then there's no sense in, you know, this is something I've been getting a lot that people say, oh, you're so brave. But the fact is that this isn't really bravery. This is our aqidah. This is what we, we have been, what we have known from the very beginning. So when a responsibility appears, we take the means to protect ourselves. We take uh, common sense approach, but at the same time, we don't run from our death. And so when the opportunity ar arose, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the others that went with me, we all had the same attitude. We all went having finalized our wills, uh, finishing up any kind of dunyawi stuff that we may have with the anticipation and the real possibility that we may not come back. But that being said, every single one of us was more than happy to have to be buried in Gaza. Like, there are very few places in the world where you'd be proud to be buried. That was one of those places. So as far as personal family issues go, obviously, my, my, my immediate family, uh, my wife and uh, my older children, uh, I told them about it. Obviously, they were very worried, uh, It was, but they were understanding. And again, this is sort of the same impression that I got from all the others that came. My wider family, I didn't tell them exactly where I was going. Uh, one is I didn't want them to worry. Two, I didn't want them to try to stop me because my mind was made up. And then three, I, was, I didn't want it to get into the broader community that I was making this trip until I actually returned back from that.
Okay, yeah, because that was actually another question I had. Did you like about political or social hurdles, you know, um, some kind of pressures and things like that from out? But you said you didn't really inform many people. So, uh, but did you did you have any sort of, you know, someone trying to stop you or some kind of social, you know, you have people in the community, even uh, organizations that try to sort of, um, that try to become obstacles or any help getting over there? Did you Did you run into anything like that? No, I had purposely, um, on the advice of the administrators for GLIA, the organization that I had gone with, uh, kept a low profile on this. Uh, mm. For the time being, I closed my Facebook account, uh, my WhatsApp message. Anyone who emailed me was ba messaged me was basically, you know, I'll get back to you. And it was convenient because it was dur during Ramadan, which you know my profile tends to go less during Ramadan, and I and I my classes, my enemy classes are off. My work schedule is lighter. So my interaction with people becomes less as well. So for the most part, I didn't actually tell very many people. There, were, I would say four people perhaps that actually knew uh, where I was going exactly in the purpose and the rest knew that I was going to Egypt and that's it. Uh, so I kept a little pro profile on purpose. I was really worried, you know, making constant dua that we don't have any hurdles that prevent us and uh, I was hesitant to let other people know because that may pose a hurdle. So for example, uh, early on in this conflict, many physicians, uh, some in New Jersey, some in New York and, and elsewhere lost their, their jobs as physicians hmm. because of their stance or the pro-Palestinian stance or even their attempt to help the Palestinians. So I didn't want uh, any sort of wider elements to uh, make my trip difficult. So for that reason, I. I kept a very low profile, didn't even tell many of those people who were around me for fear that it might get out to those people who may pose a problem. So Ramlan, this is something natural kind of, right? Like parents and close family members, they're going to feel for our safety. But I guess this is also what makes a man like having azima and uh, determination. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, bless you and uh, give all of us the same azima, inshallah. I want to get a little bit into kind of... Um your first-hand perspective that first leg of the journey from here you're going there uh, what are some of the thoughts that are going through your mind and then you know you're seeing uh, some of the things that you're coming across as you're getting closer and closer to the rafa border uh sort of the situation was there like a tension in the air what are the thoughts that are going through your mind what are you mentally preparing yourself for maybe if you can get into some of those kind of just first-hand perspective things that a lot of us probably wouldn't ever experience because you know we just haven't been through that or don't have the opportunity to go through that sort of journey. I'll tell you my observation uh, of those who went with us, myself included, there were two types of people. There were those who, who you could see were obviously anxious. Mm -hmm. And as we were crossing the Sinai and getting closer to the border, they were, and you could kind of, the tension was palpable, uh, as they say in the air, mm -hmm. uh, and their concern and their worry and their speech, or sometimes in their being quiet, you could see that they were anxious, which I think is a normal response. Uh, and then there were the second group, which I think that we had resigned ourselves to the idea that the worst that could happen is we lose our lives. And this is a form of shahada, so alhamdulillah. And I think mentally, when you have resigned yourself to that, then there's really the anxiety disappears when a lot when you hand yourself over to the affairs uh or hand your affairs over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then there's a certain sakina that descends uh, upon an individual uh knowing that whatever happens there's khair in it and there's hikmah in it so i would say these are the two types of people uh, that we we were some of us when we would hear the bombs in rafah and we can talk about that later uh would immediately become anxious and have difficulty sleeping and some of us had no difficulty sleeping, telling each other that inshallah in the morning, either we wake up and we wake up in a good state in this dunya, or we wake up in a better state in the akhirah. There, there was no there was no loss here, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, you know, a lot of times people, they uh, wonder what's the whole idea or what's the wisdom behind the concept of taqdeer or qada and qadr and accepting the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you see in situations like this, I'm sure, um, Muslims can can understand the value of that sort of aqidah, that sort of belief and knowledge that whatever is meant to happen is going to it happens with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're okay with it, whatever the decision of Allah Ta'ala is, 
and that's the best that can happen that is because it's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so just I guess for a lot of listeners sometimes that question does come to our mind and here we can see the value of it in a situation like you know in the middle of a war zone genocide whatever you want to call it basically one of the worst situations that humans uh, go through and here you find a, uh, a bedrock or a form of resolve that is unavailable to those people who don't have it well, and no. i would say since uh, since you bring up the topic that this resolve is found in the majority of the palestinians that we met to a degree that i haven't seen anywhere else it's you find it in individuals here and there but as a population this resolve of consigning your affairs over to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the phrase i heard over and over hasbi allah constantly is is there is there dhikr uh, and so I was, this mentality is represented by those people and even i think for a person if he didn't have it before he got to gaza he had it by the time he met the people of gaza just mm -hmm. being in their companionship so this was one of the questions actually i had uh, but you know i guess we'll just kind of get into it right now <laughs> Was that the Palestinians you met there? Can you tell us something about their iman, sort of, and their pain, their resolve, their hopes, their feelings? Um, how do they feel towards the ummah that's watching their plight at this moment? Uh, and what lessons, I guess, you can offer to the listeners about um, what you witnessed from them? Yeah, on one hand, it's inspirational what we witness from them, but on another hand, it's also really sad and depressing. It's inspirational in the sense that their iman and their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is extraordinarily high. And as I had mentioned, Asbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, the other phrase that we would hear would be uh, Allahu musta'an. So whenever we would speak, and I, and I made a point of if I met somebody new to talk to them and really ask them this question of how have you guys been dealing with this? They would mention some difficulty and followed by it, Wallahu musta'an, that Allah is the one who we seek help in, or Allah is the one in whom help is sought. Hmm. So this was inspirational, that we have many of ourselves uh, outside of that area where, you know, our sort of first world problems, we're complaining about this and that, uh, maybe some difficulty in our lifetime or in our life that to us is a big deal. But we will complain about it you know why allah why has this happened why me but in the meantime you see these people who have lost in some cases everything but turn their attention to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <laughs> it reminds me of an ayah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that whoever places their trust in allah Allah is sufficient for them, meaning Allah alone is sufficient for them. Inna Allah baligu amri. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, his, his command, his decision will take place. He causes it to take place. Well, uh, and in everything, Allah has put qadr, meaning a certain amount, a decision, uh, taqdeer has been decided for everything. So this ayah really, and I've heard this on the lips of some of the uh, Palestinians, some of the Ghazans, where they understood this ayah on the level that a person, if he places his trust in Allah, he doesn't need anyone else. So inspirational from that perspective, but also sad in the, in the sense that I think for many of them, they reach this stage of iman because they lost trust in everybody else. And there was no one else to trust but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, for us, if we have some difficulty, we may know, I'll call my father. I'll call my friend. You know, my one of my friends is a lawyer. He's a doctor. He has money. I'll trust my degree. I'll trust my bank account. So we always have these uh, non-entities to trust in. When a population or a person has lost everything, Right? There's no jobs, there's no money, uh, your family has been killed, your government can't protect you. Then at that point, you are forced to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is a population that has reached that degree. So again, I say inspirational because it's amazing that uh, the level of their iman and trust, but sad at the same time that they were, uh, they were brought to this situation because they've essentially lost trust in the ummah 
to really come to their aid. And, and this isn't since the conflict, the current conflict started. This is their history for the for decades now. Hmm. That as an ummah, we have really failed them, and they found themselves in this particular situation. So, um, um, just kind of like backtracking. What what what? Uh, can you give us a sense of like the dates that you went and how long you stayed there, and then before coming back? Yeah, so it was the middle of Ramadan. Uh, we had I had left from the states on March fifteenth, which was a Friday, and then as I mentioned, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> a few days in Cairo, uh, where we looked for supplies and and made contacts, and then we entered on a Wednesday, which was March twentieth, uh, is is the day that we spent. It takes pretty much the whole day, uh, crossing the Sinai and then crossing the border into Rafah, and then after that. It was initially supposed to be a two-week stint while we were there, but because we were delayed two days, it ended up being 12 days. So how long were you guys at the border? Did they hold you guys at the border for a long time? or? Uh, no. it's uh, the We left Cairo right at the time of Fajr. So we prayed Fajr on the streets, uh, got in our van, started driving. It took uh, hours to cross the Sinai. As I mentioned, there's all these checkpoints. It takes time. And then once we get you get to the actual crossing at Rafah, which I want to say we arrived somewhere after the time of Dhuhr, and then uh, there's this huge hall. You you have all of your whatever you're bringing with you, and as a group of twelve people, we brought about I want to say eighty plus suitcases with us. So wow. these are suitcases that we just packed with medications, supplies, whatever we thought would benefit them. One of the benefits of going in <laughs> as an NGO or as a, as a physician is that as we're driving to the border, we're passing, and I'm so sure you guys have seen these videos and pictures where there's just trucks lined up on the side mm -hmm. trying to get aid in. So we passed all of that. You know, we're driving through. These trucks are waiting to get in. We were able to just go straight. Uh, so they didn't uh, look through your stuff? and, and... So the uh, only thing they, will, they do is that they x-ray your stuff. So once you get to the border uh, on the Egyptian side, they will throw your all of your things into into an X-ray machine and just X-ray very quickly. Didn't seem like they were particularly interested in the things that we were bringing. They never actually opened up any of the suitcases, let us through. And once you pass through, then you come to this big hall, which is essentially where you get processed by the Palestinian uh, officials. And, and you wait. They collect everyone's passports, uh, go through all of them have you come up, take your picture, uh, scan of your fingerprints, and then eventually stamp your passport uh, with the Ghazan visa and, and let you through. And that whole process probably took us maybe another two or three hours or so. Mm -hmm. By the time we actually crossed, uh, and then once you cross into into, Pal into Gaza, you have to go through another x-ray machine, uh, another sort of processing. And it was exactly at the time of Iftar Maghrib that we actually crossed all of that and got into Rafah. I just out of curiosity, you said that the Palestinians, they processed you on the other side. This is this is now the Palestinian Authority or is it the local Gaza municipality? I, I, one of the things I didn't do while I was there was specifically ask people who they belong to. Okay. Uh, I felt, you know, if I'm going to talk to them with my American accent and say, hey, are you part of this group or part of that group? Yeah, yeah. That it may not go over well. Uh, but from what I assume uh, by their look, and, and their uniform, I, I would assume that this is the Palestinian Authority. Okay. Can you take us uh, from the, you know, okay, now you're at the border um, and, uh, you know, now you cross over. Can you um, chronologically take us, like, however you're comfortable through uh, the first few days uh, of your trip and how yeah, that... One thing is, like, we assume the roads are, have, you know, giant holes in them. Vehicles aren't really able to travel. There's issues with fuel. Uh, so kind of like walk us, you know, just kind of give everyone sort of this uh, image of what's going on. I think it might, might be helpful to divide uh, Gaza into three parts. Mm -hmm. You have the north northern part of Gaza, like a, a Shifa hospital that's just been devastated. Uh, the UN doesn't allow us to go up there. Uh, getting aid to there is, is near impossible. Uh, you just can't get there. And, and that whole area is devastated. There's no food. There's no medications. Uh, most of the the educated people, so like there's a brain drain from that area entirely. Uh, anyone who could and has the means was displaced towards the south. 
So I, it would, it's helpful to think of northern Gaza as, in, as the worst of it. And so then, is there anyone left in northern Gaza? There, there are still people. There, there are a population that's still left there. For whatever reason, they could not leave or did not want to leave. Uh, and those people are in a particularly bad situation. From what I understand, uh, Ashifa, before it was destroyed, and other hospitals uh, that were still standing had lost just about all of their physicians. Uh, I had heard of one emergency department that was being staffed by a fourth-year medical student. Like, he was the most senior person there. Wow. Uh, so the North is is the worst of the worst. And, and whenever you, you've probably come across really bad stories, we're talking about the North where Israel has actually invaded uh, troops on the ground and has done what um, we're all aware of at this point. And then there's sort of, I'm, I'm making a, a general distinction. There's the central part of Gaza, which has recently been invaded, is currently being bombarded, uh, and so they're sort of in a middle zone where uh, a lot of the casualties that are ongoing are ongoing there right now. Uh, buildings that are being dropped, people that are being killed. Uh, so that situation is is somewhat different than the northern part of Gaza. Uh, worse in the sense that there's still the ongoing killing over there, but better in the sense that they're they're not so devastated yet. And then there's the southern part of Gaza, uh, including areas of Khan Yunus and Rafah, which is where we were mostly. And Israel doesn't have troops on the ground there yet. Hmm. They are bombing. There's drones. There's fire. There's um, gunfire from the drones. There's missile attacks, but no actual troops on the ground. So I, I divide that up into a third area for the sake of understanding where people aren't dying in the same numbers as they are or have in the north and are in the central part. But food, water is more readily available. If you have money, you can purchase food and water. Having money is difficult uh, because there's no jobs. The physicians that we work with throughout the six or seven month period were paid, I think, somewhere like $400. Uh, and throughout that entire period, they were paid twice, and four hundred dollars does not go a very long way in, in, in Gaza. There's inflation; things are expensive. So, in the southern part, if you have money, you can get what you need. If you don't have money, which many people, especially those that are displaced from the south, do not, then they are the ones that you'll find malnutrition, uh, breakouts of hepatitis A. Uh, that that's there now. Uh, just to kind of clarify the mentality, we may look at the north, and, and obviously the north is devastated, and the central part is being devastated. One of the things that I think can't be understated about the south is that there is this constant fear of invasion that is on everyone's mind. Uh, whenever you speak with people, they know what's taken place nor north of them, and they're basically just waiting, and, and they fully expect that to happen in the south. And it's just this constant fear of when will it happen? Uh, what is going to happen to our families? That That's sort of the backdrop uh, of the situation. Um, just to get a sense, as you mentioned, the North is just kind of like this hellscape. Well, how many people are, are approximately, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people still there? Or? Uh, I, I don't know for sure. As far as numbers go, from what I understand, uh, just keeping up with the, the news cycle and reports within Oaza itself, uh, it sounds like there's, you know, not hundreds of thousands, but maybe on the lower end of that number. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, Gaza, it's, or Rafah itself used to have about 300,000 as a population. At this point, they're at 1.7 million. Uh, just doing the numbers real quick, if we say that the population of Gaza initially was about two or above two million, yeah. then we're still talking about 300 to 400,000 people that are still scattered throughout central and uh, northern of Gaza. Yeah, I was just asking because uh, recently they they did mention or it was uh, announced, you know, that um, there's famine has already started. There's starvation in the north. So I was just, you know, a lot of people are just thinking uh, about, you know, what are the numbers we're talking about of people that are in that extremely precarious uh, situation. And and also like uh, the aid that people are sending, you know, the first thing is a lot of it is waiting at the border. But the, um, the, the amount that actually, uh, that's actually making it in 
how much of it is actually getting to the north where it's probably most needed? Yeah, as far as I can tell, very little, wow. very little. Yeah. It's just not safe. So even, I mean, you, for example, many of us wanted to go to the north, right? We're here to take care of people. There's a huge need in the north, but we weren't permitted to. The UN and, and our own organization simply did not give us permission to do that because of the danger involved in it. So the same thing goes for the the aid and the and the drivers of those trucks that they need clearance that it'd be somewhat safe for them to drive up and come back down again. But the situation is such that it's just not safe for, for the drivers themselves to go and make that trip. So mm -hmm. There's also the issue of accessibility. I think like a lot of the building roads are blocked off with fallen buildings and it's just, it would be, even if they were to get supplies out there, like the people would have to come and get the supplies. You couldn't get supplies to people. Right, not there. Yeah, you couldn't hand them out to people. Not to mention, it's not just the roads. You still have to go through the checkpoints, right? The the invading yeah. army has their own checkpoints. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that they've essentially built a road dividing the north and the south completely. Yeah. So you have to get through all of that. And whether or not they'll let you through is, is an entirely different issue. Could you tell us about the condition of the hospitals in, in Gaza? Uh, which ones were you posted at and, you know, kind of the situation at the hospitals? So in Rafah area, we, myself, I was posted at uh, Emirati Hospital initially, which is a maternal uh, and delivery. Initially, it was just a clinic for maternity and delivery. Uh, but since the war, uh, the conflict has broken out and people have been displaced, it's sort of been upgraded to uh, a hospital status. So you're, you're talking about what would normally be a clinic, and now all of a sudden adding on tents, uh, building out rooms and just trying to expand whatever you can to, to make it into a hospital. Uh, when I had first arrived, I was told that there was a need in their neonatal ICU. Now I'm an emergency medicine physician. I spend most of my time with adults, although I, although I do, do take care of children, but I am not a neonatologist. However, the situation was so bad that they said, you know what, just having you around will be better than having nobody around. So I had initially started off in that hospital in their neonatal ICU. Afterwards, I was transitioned into an emergency department at a Najjar hospital in Rafah as well. Najjar is similar. It is a, it's not really, normally it's not really a hospital in the sense that we think of it. It's a small emergency department attached to an inpatient unit, uh, but since then has had, it to expand, has had to expand significantly just to keep up with the population. So most of my emergency work was done there. People from our team were also associated with another hospital, Indonesian hospital, which was initially built by MSF, I believe, but then now funded and run by an Indonesian organization. So a lot of their staff is from Indonesia and it's called the Indonesian Hospital, uh, where we met a lot of really good people. I also had the opportunity to go out towards the Khan Yunus area to Mustashfa Shohadad Aqsa, which is just known as Aqsa Masjid, uh, which sees a lot more trauma. It is a proper hospital. And uh, we had a, an opportunity to do what's called a site visit twice there to go see what the conditions were, speak with the physicians and the staff and, and get a feel for it. And were you, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, were you guys allowed to like um, just interact with anybody and uh, pretty much you were free there or you had very strict restrictions on wh uh, what to do, who to talk to, stuff like that? No, actually, there really were no restrictions. The I suppose as we have them in this in the United States or, or in Canada are controlled, meaning you can't just walk into an inpatient unit. You can't just walk into an emergency department. That's not the case over there. People can just off the street, walk into an emergency department, come look around and walk out. Uh, they can oftentimes I would take care of a patient and then go somewhere to sit down for a little bit in some corner of the hospital. The family of the patients would just start walking around the entire hospital until they found me in that corner. So it's it's unlike the situation that we have in our hospitals here. There's really no control or security there. I had spoken to some of the officials as to why don't you have security? You've got all these people walking around that are really uh, taking up space. They cause confusion and crowding. Uh, apparently they had tried to, but were really unsuccessful in doing that. So because there's this lack of sort of control, we too could walk around wherever we wanted. We could 
go through the entire hospital, look in every corner, speak to whoever we'd like. And there's really no one to, to stop you. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> well, well, I mean, I guess the, the lack of control also, because there's just a lack of any kind of, you know, um, systems, everything is kind of broken down, right? We're really, is really that dealing with like the bottom thread? Is that true? Like, is there, is there a breakdown of, of system and order completely or how is it? The, so on a communal level, there's still order. I mean, the Palestinian people are very noble people, very gracious people. Uh, there are, I think in any situation, you're going to get people who are sort of on their, you know, they're on their last uh, thread there. They're frustrated. They're they're quick to anger because of the situation. They're in a situation of desperation. They're trying to help out their family, their friends, themselves. So that we definitely saw. We saw people fighting each other uh, over sometimes small things, and the others would watch and and they would try to calm down individuals that were fighting, and then turn to us and say, "This is what they want from us. This is what they want us to do. They want us to fight." So. For this reason, we can't fight. We can't be fighting amongst each other. Um, but on 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 the whole part, I would say at a communal level, there everyone is still looking out for each other. Everyone has lost. Period. Everyone has lost. Everyone has lost property, homes, family members, extended family members. So there's this shared sense of loss among everybody that's there. More specifically. The medical system, the healthcare system is gone. It's it's completely fallen apart. Access to resources is very limited. Things that we take for granted, when you go to an emergency department, you get an IV put in, you get blood drawn, and you get blood work done. Over there, they just the uh, most of the blood work that we would do, they just don't have access to it. You you can't get it done. You want a urinalysis, you want to have your urine checked. It can't be done. The test just doesn't exist anymore. You need to have your electrolytes looked at. It can't be done. It's just not there anymore. Uh, so from that perspective, the healthcare system has collapsed entirely. And you know, despite the fact that there are very gifted physicians there, there are very well-trained doctors, there is hospital administration that cares, they, they can't do anything. It, it is the worst medicine I have ever seen or ever practiced. And my, my reference point for that is, is probably the times of COVID where New Jersey was hit pretty hard. Our hospitals were full. We had lack of resources, lack of ven ventilators. But what I saw in Gaza doesn't even compare. It's not even close. Uh, you just don't have the things that you need to practice. And I can get into specifics if you'd like, but... Yeah, you mentioned yeah. you went to uh, Aqsa and those hospitals kind of there in central Gaza, uh, and you guys went kind of as an observer. Uh, could you tell us kind of what you saw and, and give us any anecdotes or details of, of the devastation or the, the suffering? When you walk into Aqsa, or actually as you pull into Aqsa, even, even before you pull into Aqsa, as, you, as you're going through the streets, one thing that hits you is the number of people on the streets. Mm. The streets are crowded. There's tents along the streets that people are living out of. Uh, there's no, you know, once you start living in tents, then forget about trash collection, forget about sewage. So there's piles of trash just because there's nothing else you can do with it. There's water that looks like sewage water that seeps out. And so as you're coming, you just, you're, weaving through uh, bodies of people, uh, other cars, uh, donkey carts, uh, whatever uh, bicycles, whatever means that people have as you get towards the hospital. Once you enter the gates of Aqsa, then you see even more tents. People have just set up tents around the hospital out of the hope that this will be the safest place that we can be. That out of the hope that hospitals will be the least likely to be bombed or shot. And so people have just, they're just living ar around the hospital. Uh, as, a, as a side note, uh, soon, it was perhaps the day after, or the second day after we had left from our second site visit, that right across the street, meaning right in front of the gates of the hospital, uh, a drone had opened fire 
uh, wounding and killing journalists and and civilians uh, right literally in, where we had gone in front of the hospital. Once you get into the actual hospital itself, you enter into the entrance, it's even more crowded. And there's people who are living in the hallways. They've set up little, they've set up beds, they've got their uh, suitcases, they've got little tents that this is in the hallway. I mean, if you can imagine going into, into a hospital here, walking through the hallways and just seeing along the lines, along the, the walls, having tents set up or any area that would have been like uh, an open area is now an area full of beds, not of patients. There are patients that are lining the hospital walls as well. But these are people who have just moved into the hospital to to have some sense of uh, protection while they're there. And go ahead. And what kind of patients uh, were you seeing most of the time? Uh, there's two types of patients. One is sort of what we all think of, which is the trauma, um, particularly at, at Aqsa because it's close to the fighting. There is a lot of uh, trauma from from shrapnel or gunfire uh, from from uh, drones so you see a lot of injuries to the chest to the abdomen uh, even to the extremities as well uh, when we walked into the emergency department at aqsa the first patient that i actually saw he was four years old who had shrapnel basically uh, a missile or a bomb had gone off shrapnel came he had lacerations cuts to his face face was completely swollen. I'm sure there were some fractures to the face as well. This is a four-year-old. Uh, the face is burnt uh, from, from the explosion. And then he was wearing clothes, but despite that, he had marks of shrapnel throughout his body. And um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I won't forget, I mean, obviously the sight of this child is something that you won't forget, but it's also the sight of the father next to him. Uh, with his own head, his face buried in his own hands. Oh. You know, as, as a father myself, and I think any man can understand that it is your core responsibility to protect your family. It is your core responsibility to protect your children. Hmm. And, you know, we'll, no one will blame the father here. But as a father, you will feel a sense of failure for not having protected your own four-year-old from this sort of uh, trauma. And that's what I saw in this, this poor gentleman's face was that his son is lying there and and you could just see in his face. And this is something that we saw repeatedly whenever we saw children is the, the child himself, is, that's a sad situation, but looking at the parents is, is also something that I think we all kind of feel and, and, and we never wanna be in that situation. One question I had here is, um, you know, as an emergency doctor, obviously over the course of years and years of practice, you're gonna become desensitized to some degree, right? Working in the US, how much did that, de uh, which is, it's natural, right? How much did that desensitization kind of carry over there or was it just so much worse that? I mean, did it even prepare you for what you yeah. were experiencing? You don't, uh, I'll, I'll correct you a little bit. You don't get desensitized. What happens is that you learn to com compartmentalize. So while you're working on somebody that's very sick, you learn to sort of compartmentalize the human side of you and take care of, it sounds bad, but it's what you have to do to survive. You take care of the biology that's in front of you. Hmm. So emergency physicians have a remarkable remarkable ability to compartmentalize. It's, it's part of our training. So what happens is that you will take care of something really bad. While you're doing it, you're not thinking about the human aspect of it. Later on, you will have to do that. You can't run from it. So wow. once you've taken care of your patient, after you're done, after your shift, then you have to process that. And the same thing happened there as well. So while we're taking care of patients, we can do that. But then at the end of the shift, uh, into the night, and I would say even till now, um, that processing continues where you have to bring back the images, think about it, work your way through it. Um, and, and of course, our deen becomes a great benefit in that situation, that we know that there is a hikmah in everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. We know that this trauma that we see, those who, who pass away are shuhada, 
and they're, they're enjoying themselves in their qabr and then they will enjoy themselves in Jannah. We know that these children who suffered so much here, despite the loss that their parents feel and we feel, we comfort ourselves knowing that they are feeling nothing at this point. They're only feeling uh, happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they, they often mention that uh, this war, there's just an unprecedented number of uh, children and women. Is that, did you get that sense when you were there that this is like... Yeah. One of the things I didn't mention to you is that when you do enter Gaza, the first thing that becomes apparent, and, and I've been to, you know, Hamdan, I've been to a lot of places, but I've never felt this, <laughs> is that as soon as you walk in, as soon as you walk into Gaza, children are everywhere. Mm. I've never been in a place where it just strikes you that there are youth, so many of them. And we're talking about elementary, middle school, that age group. So we're not even like college. I'm not, when I say youth, I mean young kids. Yeah. Yeah. They're kids and they're everywhere. They're on the streets playing. Uh, whenever they see foreigners, they come up and they, they walk along you. They try to speak whatever English words they know to you, uh, but they are everywhere. And there is no way that you can um, attack this population without without uh, at least 50% of your casualties being children. Yeah, yesterday I was listening to the news and they were talking about how a missile strike had killed 20 some people and out of them 11 were children. This just happened yesterday in uh, somewhere near Rafa actually. Yeah, there was a few um, months ago where uh, an entire building was was bombed, dropped, with a hundred some people in that building and half 50, 50 of them were children. So, and once you actually see the streets, you understand why that's the case. It's that they're everywhere. Is there now, um, this is kind of going a little bit, uh, into the actual war or off topic, I guess we can say, but when they drop these buildings and they take out usually like, you know, they'll recover maybe 20, 30 people. How, how many people are still left? you know, in that rubble, because, you know, you have a five, six story building. Um, there was probably not only 20 or 30 people in there. And most of the time, that's what's recovered. Um, do you have a sense of how many people are still stuck under the rubble there? No, I, I can't say as far as like a percentage. But what I can tell you is what we had witnessed is when a building is dropped, if it's dropped during the daytime, then those that are easily accessible will be brought to the hospital and they will come within 10, 15 minutes of the missile being, uh, of the building being dropped. And then they don't have any excavating equipment. It's not easily found. And so after that, it's just by hand. So whatever you can by hand reach, you will reach them over the next few hours. And then after that, you just can't get to anyone else. The situation that's during the day, the situation at nighttime is that there's a curfew. And oftentimes bombings are followed by other bombings. So it's just not safe to be out. So any, any buildings that were dropped during the nighttime, uh, people would show up within 15, 20 minutes, whoever they could salvage, they would do it, send them to the emergency department. And after that, they would just call it and say, go home. We'll come back during the daytime. Mm. Uh, and so then, you know, whoever gets stuck overnight is stuck overnight. And during the daytime, they'll come back and try to find whoever else they can. And again, to whatever extent they're able to. And after that, you just leave it. Did you see uh, or did you witness or, uh, you know, any buildings fall, uh, falling or what was what were the most dangerous things uh, that you witnessed there? Uh, yeah, were you guys ever put in danger? Like, what's the situation? That's one of the questions we had, like the, the safety of the hospital itself. So we stayed, uh, I myself stayed at the hospital just one night. Uh, we actually had an apartment in, sorry, we had an apartment in the residential area of Rafa, where we, we stayed and spent most of our time. So there was a curfew uh, for us as well. We could leave in the morning. So we would leave around 7.30 or so in the morning, but we'd have to be back by uh, Maghrib time. So we'd end up leaving the hospital, say around 5 p.m., 5.30 p.m., depending on the day. Uh, so now speaking to your question, we lived among the, the residents, not separated out into hospital, in the hospital itself. Uh, I mean, many things I can say about that. For for one, I found our neighbors, because we lived in a building with other people, I found them to be the most gracious people that uh, I've ever met. 
they would bring us food. We were told when we went into Gaza that you do not eat the food of the Palestinians because they don't have much and you're going to come in and take it from them. You should not take it. So we all brought uh, protein bars, camping food, everything that I needed for the two weeks I brought with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat any of it. I mean, very maybe one or two days worth is all I touched because every day our neighbors and those around us brought us food. Uh, and we couldn't say no. They were, they were just that gracious. When those nights where the bombings got particularly bad or close to us, they would invite us for coffee and attempt to distract us from the sounds of the bombs that were going off mm -hmm. just to make us feel better so that we didn't worry. So now coming back to your question, there were times. So the, pro the way the process works is called deconfliction. Wherever we are, at every single moment, we are to report to Israel saying that we are here. So the apartment that we stayed at, we had to run it by Israel first to say that we are going to stay in this apartment. Is it okay? And they would say, yes, it's okay, or no, it's not okay. So once they deconflict that apartment, it's essentially we are taking on faith that they won't bomb that area. It's, it's safe to be in. Whenever we would travel, so for example, you saw the, uh, the WCK, the World Central Kitchen um, uh, volunteers that were uh, killed recently, that they had a process, they went through the same process of deconfliction before they made that trip. They reported to Israel saying that we are going to take this route at this time. And Israel would say, it's okay, you can do that. So we had the same process whenever we traveled. In fact, we traveled on the same road that they had traveled maybe a couple a day or a couple of days before that with the exact same process. So as an international, we had up until the WCK um, killing, no international had been harmed through this process of deconfliction. So we had this sense of security knowing that no one had been killed if they followed this procedure. So this is what we did. Our procedure was to tell Israel, this is where we're staying. This is the hospital. This is the apartment. And these are the routes that we will be taking on these particular day. And so we had a sort, you know, in hindsight, it was a false sense of security. Once we saw what happened to the WCK employees or the volunteers, uh, but that was something that we sort of trusted. There were bombings close to where we lived at times. Uh, most of the time further away, we could hear it in the Khan Yunus area uh, and, and so on. Uh, but there were bombings in the Rafah area. I think the closest was maybe 200 meters from us uh, that we actually heard. You could hear the missiles going by. How often but, would you hear the missiles? Nightly, uh -huh. daily. Uh, it, it was, I wouldn't say all of the time, but several times throughout the day. It but that's not considering true. that you're in Rafah, in I think in the north and in central Gaza, it was it was far more worse. I think. Uh, so imagine you would be able to hear what's happening in central Gaza, in Khan, uh, where you were also, or is that? Yeah, not? I mean, if you think about it, uh, Gaza is not that big, right? Yeah. So central, um, like the areas of Khan Yunus that were being attacked uh, heavily, they're four or five miles from us, so it wasn't that far. And then, so from what I understand, the MO of the invading force is that they bomb first, soften up targets, uh, drop buildings before invasion. So even till this day, if you follow the news, Rafa still gets bombed. Uh, they find a building, they drop the building, uh, even though there's no invading force yet. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> also wanted to um, we wanted to ask you about um, the danger that's facing doctors and emergency humanitarian personnel. It's not just doctors, right? There's a lot of humanitarian, and especially if they're Palestinian and not really international. Um, what's the danger level for them? And was there any interaction between you guys? You already mentioned you didn't really interact with the uh, invading uh, forces. Uh, or did you get a sense that they didn't want you there also? Who didn't want us? The invading forces. Oh, so yeah, we didn't really interact with them. So I yeah. couldn't tell you that. But uh, as far as if you look at the stats, you know, near 200 journalists killed. They're all Palestinian. Uh, near 200 doctors and medical care staff killed. Near almost all of them are Palestinian. Uh, so the, que the question that you pose about Palestinian aid workers, Palestinian 
uh, healthcare workers, Palestinian journalists, it seems that I wouldn't even say that they're like the general population, but rather it seems like they're being targeted. Mm. It's there's some benefit in being an in, in, uh, international, obviously. Uh, but with well, the sad part about all of this is that as internationals, we have a sense of security. But as Palestinians, if anything, there's it seems like there's a mark on your back and it's even more dangerous for them. And at the same time, whereas we saw with the WCK uh, volunteers, there was outrage across the world, rightfully so. There have been many, many more aid workers that are Palestinian that have just been completely neglected uh, as they've been killed. Yeah, this needs to be the level of dehumanization of the Palestinian aid workers, because you, whenever you hear about an international anyone international anything happening to them there's a lot of uh, noise about it but like you mentioned they're being killed in the hundreds actually but just because they're palestinian it's not really being covered uh, i also wanted to ask one question related to the last point um, you spoke about you know the sound of missiles and you recently just i think before this podcast you did uh, you had a post on uh, the sound in the sky in, in gaza right with the drones can you speak to how you know uh, how it was just being there? What were the sounds like, and and just even referencing that post? Yeah. yeah so as soon, as soon as you cross the border into into Gaza, then you start hearing the sound of the drone drone, and then and usually there's just one in the sky, but it's just this constant constant sound. It's th there during the day. It's there during the night. In fact, before we had gotten there, our organizers had advised that we buy earplugs. Because mm. people, the sound is, it's not distant. The sound is there. It's, it's unmistakable. Uh, and if you're not used to it, it's, 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 it's worrying. So the Palestinians told me that the drones have been there even before this conflict. The drones have been there for a really long time. So they've essentially gotten accustomed to them. Whereas I found it, at times I could drown it out and forget about it. But at times, whenever I, I would find myself in the day just hearing it. Sometimes they would come down really low, and that would be concerning because we know that many of these drones have missiles, have uh, the ability to gunfire as well. So when they really used to come low, uh, it would it would be you know anxiety provoking. In addition to that, and I'll say this sort of as an American, uh, you know, American born and raised, we have this sense of privacy. We would never tolerate a camera that's watching me outside of my house or whenever I leave the house. We would never tolerate this level of invasion of privacy. Uh, and so being an American there, that too bothered me that how is it justifiable that you can watch me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whenever I step out of the house or even when I'm in the house, if I look out the window, uh, I'm sure they've got heat sensing abilities to know how many bodies are in the house and so on. So this constant surveillance of, of being watched, I, I found to be unnatural. And really, I was amazed at how the Palestinians just sort of, and I guess they don't really have a choice. They just gave into it and said, well, this is our situation. We are watched 24 seven as as a prisoner, as somebody in a, in a camp. Uh, in addition, so this constant sound in the background, and as I had mentioned in the, in the post, when I had returned, I, I still like I found myself searching for that noise. Uh, there's been a couple of times where I've heard a propeller plane overhead and, and I'll just stop. Uh, it'll, it'll remind me of that. There was a time where I was walking the street and there was a, a little motorbike that made that same kind of uh, drone noise. And as soon as I hear it, I have to stop. And it just re re brings back memories of these things in the sky. Uh, in addition to that, what I referenced was the sound of jets that would just go overhead and you would feel the rumble uh, as they went over. And same thing, even till the, even now, which has probably been two weeks, three weeks that I've since I've gotten out, almost three, two, two and a half weeks. Uh, I still have that sense that I hear rumble in the sky and I'm immediately reminded uh, of, of those jets flying over. So that's, you know, sort of me adjusting back to uh, American life, but I, I can't imagine the, the life for Palestinians. And as I had mentioned too, when they when our apartments, those in, in the building with us invited us, 
we would sit there with them and you would hear the planes, the jets fly, fly overhead. I'm sure they heard it as well, but they continued to talk to us to try to distract us as we're listening to them, but our ears are really outside. Oh. Or the sound of children. Like I said, the children are everywhere. They play late into the night. It's Ramadan, right? In our countries, uh, in Ramadan, you're out at night. Kids are playing at night. Uh, but these kids, they would hear the drones and it made no difference. They kept playing. They would hear the jets. It made no difference. They would keep playing. Uh, the only time that they would really stop is when you heard missile fire. And then you would you would watch them. They would wait for a second. Then you'd hear the building collapse or the, the hit maybe a little further away. And then they would just go back to playing as if it's like, you know, it's not our time right now. Let's keep playing. Hmm. Can you talk about like the psychology uh, that uh, that you witnessed there and some of the conversations you had? I know you mentioned that you made it a point to talk to people and what were some of the most memorable co uh, conversations? What were what was the psychology of the people uh, like there uh, after going through so much for so many decades? I think the most inspiring conversations I had were with the older physicians. Uh, when I had spoken to them, because a lot of, if you have money, you can get out of Gaza. You can find a way out. And many of them have money saved up from before when they were being paid, or they have a family who live outside who can get the money if they need to. And if they really wanted to, they could probably find a way out of Gaza, but they don't leave. So the really inspirational discussions I had were with those physicians saying, you're not able to practice medicine the way that you want to practice. Your family, your children, yourself are living out of a tent. Uh, life is difficult. You have the money, you have the means, why don't you leave? And the reply back I would get from them is that we became physicians. We trained for this very day, for this day when our people would be in the worst condition that they've ever been in. And, and by the way, as an aside, every single person I spoke to said in the history of the Palestinian people from the time of the Nakba and on, this is the worst they've ever had it. Mm, wow. And so despite this, what was most inspirational for me were these physicians who said, we're not going anywhere. We will die here, but we will die taking care of our people uh, with the abilities that we have. Uh, and, and so that, uh, I think, speaks volumes to the personality traits of the Palestinians, their sense of community, their sense of belonging, uh, and their sense that even though perhaps the rest of the world has given up on them, they still have each other and and they will find a way through this. And uh, how much of that do you think was fueled by uh, Islam and how much do you think was, you know, maybe their own, um, you know, uh, traits and, and uh, attributes? I, I would say all of it's Islam. And the reason I say that is that when you cross from Egypt into Palestine, into Gaza, one thing that becomes apparently and, and almost immediately clear is the level of outward religiosity, of outward iman of the Palestinian people. There's in their speech, in their dress, in their look, um, Islam is everywhere. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're all educated in their deen, but in their belief, in their outward expression, in their speech, Islam permeates all of that. So when you start speaking to them as to their condition, it always comes back to this idea of having tawakkul in Allah, of trusting in Allah, of no matter what happens to us, uh, Allah will take care of it. Uh, this idea of looking for shahada and this is this was just common uh, everyone was is is convinced with yaqeen that death means shahada and, and that's a good thing hmm. so I, I don't think it's necessarily and obviously you know Gaza has a long history of islam from imam uh, imam shafi and and the hundreds of thousands of scholars that have come out of that area since then uh, the role of that area in warding off the crusaders the the role of that area in hosting Salahuddin uh, and so on. This is an area that is steeped in Islam, and it it forms their their kind of greater psyche. There's I actually no want to go deeper into this. I have uh, two questions here. 
Um, the first is that to reach this level of terbiya at a communal level, right? What kind of, um, you can say, harakas or movements have, have allowed them to reach this at that level? Because, you know, uh, for example, in, in the sub Indian subcontinent context, uh, you have like uh, tabligh, right? Or you will have uh, tasawwuf, right? Um, are there such communal uh, movements that have, um, you know, uh, caused this uh, to, to occur or what is the what is the um, mechanism there so i'll i'll speak from how i understand it and i may be mistaken in this i, I don't want to speak as if i'm i'm a, I'm a Ghazan myself yeah. i'm not i'm not palestinian obviously my my family is from the subcontinent but from my um, impression the way i understand it is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he brings people to him increases their iman, increase, increases their tawakkul in one of two ways. One is ikhtiyari, meaning by choice, by personal effort or communal effort. And one is iddirari, which is by compulsion. So some people, let's say most people, have to work at their iman. And so you need these movements. You need movements like tabligh, you need ulama, uh, you need... Uh, uh, tariq, uh, and, and so on to get people there we have to convince them we have to get, do a, a halaqat and, and bayans and, and all of this to increase people's iman this is the state of the majority of the world the state that appeared to me of the Palestinians is one of iddirari that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put them in such a situation that the situation itself compels them towards iman. It compels them towards tawakkul. And in a way, their difficulty, and I say this understanding that difficulty is difficulty and trauma is trauma, but in a way, their difficulty and their trauma, Allah has compelled them to become closer to Him. Right? And on the Day of Judgment, we're not going to be asked how, or in the Qabr, you won't be asked how you came to iman. The question will just be, Man Rabbuk, you know, Man Nabiyuk, Madinuk. It's just, it's not an explanation of how you achieved it. It's just, do you have Iman or do you not? On the Day of Judgment, the same thing. When people's level of taqwa is appreciated, when their level of Iman is appreciated, it's not about how you got there. It's about the fact that you actually got there. So Allah blesses some people and, and Allah does what He wills. He gets people to a high state of iman through the difficulty that they are placed or difficulties that they are placed in. So to answer your question, my impression of the state of their iman is not necessarily something ikhtiyari where they themselves have made that effort, but rather one of their condition in which Allah has taken them to that, to that level. And I guess we could also add to the generational... Um footprint that Islam has had there uh, with the ulama that you mentioned and all the other, you know, ghazawat and things like that. Um, that definitely also is uh, kind of ties into what you were saying as well. Um, but I wanted to shift back a little bit towards um, asking about, because a lot of people are asking this question just to, kind of to get a sense of what they can do uh, to help out over there. So uh, some people, they were asking us like, ask uh, to ask you like what are the most common types of injuries and things um that you saw i can't ask you about psychological state like ptsd and that because they're still going through it and wallah alam how that'll play out but if you could uh, speak to maybe some of the most common type of injuries and um that you saw and and some of the things that people could probably send or try to help out with or maybe even a doctor who's about to go like what supplies he could take from egypt or from us exactly so what to be ready for I think it's worth clarifying that the conflict is shifting into a different stage. So mm -hmm. initially, the conflict was in a stage of bombardment and and uh, and trauma, meaning physical trauma. So we so they were seeing a lot of amputations, uh, a, a lot of shrapnel injuries, and so you saw what you'd expect in a war zone. Uh, that's one aspect. That's still there, but not to the same degree especially not in Rafah in the south, you still see those injuries. But what you see more of 
is medical illnesses because of the complete destruction of healthcare. So normally, if somebody is a heart patient, they will follow up with their cardiologist, they'll be placed on medications that prevent medical issues. If you're a diabetic, you'll have access to your medications, you'll see your primary care doctor, so you don't fall into the complications that can arise from your diabetes. But when the entire healthcare system has absolutely collapsed, then there is no primary care to follow up with, there is no access to medication in the same way. So what we end up seeing now, more so than trauma, it are medical problems that are exacerbated because of infrastructure is no longer there. So for those who are going in, uh, and I, I say I made the same, I had the same impression that I was going to go in and just deal with trauma 24 seven. The fact is that is an aspect of it, but the vast majority of care that gets taken place are related to medical issues that are no longer being taken care of because the entire infrastructure has fallen apart. Or for example, malnutrition. In the United States, I don't I don't see malnutrition. Over there, you see malnutrition. You see people with really low albumin protein levels, so that now they start building a fluid in their body. Uh, hepatitis A, which is a a disease of uh, of poor sanitation. Otherwise, you don't see it. If you have proper sanitation, you do not. You rarely see hepatitis A. Over there, it's it's rampant. Uh, a, another issue is the fact that many people don't have shoes. And the oh. the land is, is rocks. It, it's it's dirt, dust, sand, and rocks. So if you're walking around without shoes, you get ulcerations, lacerations. You get cuts of your feet. They become infected, and then you can go to the emergency department. You can go to a wound care clinic and have that cut sewn back up again. You can have antibiotics given for an infection. But if you're just going to go back out without shoes, you're going to be back with the same problem again. And so it's these type of injuries now that are becoming much more common. And is, if anyone's going in, this is what they have to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. Any particular supplies you would recommend for doctors uh, to purchase more of? Uh, the, the, our recommendation at this point is that whatever hospital you're going to, that you contact the administrator there, you or your organization, and you get a list of what they need. What they need. Their needs sort of fluctuate. Sometimes they'll get... Uh, a do doctors who bring in a ton of antibiotics. So that's taken care of. But in the meantime, they need some other medication that they don't have access to. So those needs are really um, hospital specific and each person should find out what it is that they need. Can you tell us about your journey back? Like what are the marks that this- or, Sorry, before, before the journey back, are there any, is there anything more memorable or any uh, final things that you wanna mention from, from the trip in Gaza? I think from the situation of medical care, I'll mention that what I mentioned that I, I was in a neonatal ICU and the vast majority of deliveries that take place now are premature. The reason they're premature is because nutrition is bad and stress levels are high. Most women, uh, most children born now are born somewhere in the 32, 34 week range. So everyone's a preemie. Uh, if you're born and you're well, you go home with your parents. But because you, many are preemies now, they're born and they're not quite ready to go home. Um, so they go up to the neonatal ICU. And what I saw there was really depressing. Again, doctors are very capable, but without the right tools, there's only so much you can do. We, uh, once you get into the, once you have these newborns come into the ICU, they don't have nutrition. Um, normally in our ICUs here, we'll give them nutrition through IV, through a mouth or through a tube. We'll find a way because kids need calories and especially kids that are having difficulty breathing. They need even more calories there. They just don't have it. So anyone who comes into their ICU, if you if they have to stay longer than a few days or more than a week, that's pretty much a death sentence. And wow. it was common to see these kids die. One, no nutrition. You can only last for so long. Two, sanitation isn't good. Uh, the things that we take for granted, gloves, soap, uh, disinfectants are not available. And so you had bacteria that were sorry, you had bacteria that were antibiotic resistant that you would never see in an ICU uh, otherwise, in a neonatal ICU specifically. 
but we were seeing children become septic and die from from those things. Um, so what sticks with me are these absolutely preventable deaths, especially in children. These kids do not have to die, but they're dying purely because of the circumstance that they were born into. And the same thing on the adult side as well. Uh, if you stop breathing or your heart stops, that's it. It's game over. There is no CPR. There is no uh, putting person a person on a ventilator because they don't have the resources for that. Uh, even in the ICU, they had, I, when I was there, three ventilators. And if there was a fourth child, then they had to make a decision. Either that fourth child was just allowed to die, or one of the three who were on a ventilator were taken off to support that fourth one instead. And this was a decision that the doctors were making on a daily basis as to who was going to live and who was going to die. Uh, same thing in the, on the adult side as well. Uh, there was, for the entire region, there was no MRI machines. There was one CAT scan machine for the entire region. So if you had somebody, and with trauma especially, CAT scans are necessary. If somebody's bleeding inside their head, we need to know that. Uh, the hospital I was stationed at, and Najar did not have a CT scan. If we needed one, we had to send them to another hospital. I watched people in front of me. Uh, I know they're bleeding inside their head. I don't need a CAT scan to tell me that. I can see it. I can see the uh, the neurologic changes, and I couldn't do anything. I'm trying to get them to the trauma center, to the neurologic, uh, to the CT scan and the neurosurgeon, but I'm watching them die, and I know by the time they get there, they're, they're not going to make it. And these are, and again, my point being that this is all preventable. These are deaths that are taking place because someone somewhere has decided that this is okay to happen and they will accept it happening. I think from a medical perspective, that's what, what really sticks, stuck with me. SubhanAllah, you know, this, uh, some, some people, they frame this whole, um, thing as, um, like you have a few, um, political leaders who have made the decision on behalf of the whole population to resist and uh, they don't really care what happens. How much uh, do the Palestinian, Palestinian people feel um, that this is their resistance and that, um, you know, this is a uh, basically uh, something we're giving for the sake of Allah to be free? And how much of that is shared and or, uh, versus uh, is there just betterment, you know, that, hey, this was a decision that was taken without our consultation, maybe? I think it's it's helpful to understand first what their baseline was before the conflict. Sure. So before the conflict, they already had the sense that the Ummah had given up on them, right? You had the Abraham Accords, you had Netanyahu go in front of the, in front of the UN with a map uh, in which Palestine wasn't there. The Ummah hadn't said anything. So the baseline that we entered this conflict into was already a sense of abandonment and consigning themselves over to whatever their affair, affairs had been. Now, since the conflict, things have gotten, as I mentioned, this is the worst that they've ever had it. So from that perspective, you'll find there are some people who say, who have the opinion, the attitude that we were never in a good situation to begin with. Yes, this is this is worse, but this is what Allah has destined for us, and we will we will continue with it. Uh, I met plenty of other people that disliked the hukuma, the government, but supported the difa, the resistance. And so as far as the resistance goes, there seems to be just across the board, everyone is uh, with them. Uh, and I think that speaks to this idea that in order to support the resistance, you have to, um, you have to accept the idea that there was oppression that was already pre-existing. Mm. So I think if we look at look at it from that perspective, is everyone behind the government? No. Is everyone behind the resistance? Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Can Can you tell us about your journey back and just along with that also kind of give a, a sense to people here that want to help what they can actually do? So on the way back, uh, as we left, and we were only there for 12 days, but it felt like a really long time. And I'll tell you personally, after thinking about it, why I felt like it was a long time was because of the feeling of helplessness. Mm. Uh, we went there to help. And you know, I'd like to think, and the people that we were with 
told us that we definitely helped. We helped in the sense that we brought in medications and supplies that would have otherwise taken weeks and months to get in. We helped in the sense that we showed them that although it seems to you that the ummah has given up on you, there are people in the ummah that are willing to come and join you in your in your difficulty and stand by you. And just on that point, if I, how many uh, doctors were actually like Muslims or how many were? No. No? So in our, the majority of doctors are, are, are Muslim. The majority of international physicians are Muslim. In our group of 12, there were two non-Muslim. Uh, sorry, three. No, mm -hmm. two. Yeah, two non-Muslim. Uh, and the rest of them were Muslims of, of mostly Palestinian heritage, Palestinian Jordanian, Palestinian Ye uh, Lebanese, uh, mm -hmm. and then a few uh, that weren't. And as we traveled around and met other physicians, we met people, Muslims from North America, from Europe, uh, from Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, but yeah, and we did meet some uh, non-Muslims here and there as well who uh, were risking their lives to help out Muslims. SubhanAllah, yeah. may Allah give them the best, which is Islam. And, yeah. um, you know, f of course, like Muslims don't have a monopoly on bravery, right? So right. can you, uh, what would be their motivation, right? What was their setup, uh, mental setup that allowed them to, to go forward with this? I think it's it's the idea or even the universal, the, the very Islamic concept, but the universal idea of justice and being against oppression. Mm -hmm. And and people who still have the sense have a sense of humanity, who have not been dehumanized, will see difficulty wherever it be, and attempt to help those people regardless of what their own religion is, uh, and what the religion of the people be. Well, Doctor Molana Mateen Khan, Jazakallah Khair for um, gracing us with your time. I know you're busy, yeah. and uh, this was really insightful. And uh, we thank you for coming on. And uh, inshallah, to our listeners and those watching, we ask that inshallah you share the video, uh, you like and subscribe as well to the channel, inshallah, to get the video as much views, uh, just so that, especially with this video, so that the word spreads and uh, it's shared and people, a lot of people, especially the Muslims, um, they're curious, they're, they have this passion, they want, I mean, I know, Personally, a lot of people wish they could just be there and share uh, in the suffering, you know, that's happening, but they can't. But you know, a lot of people are curious and they want to know and they want to get a sense of uh, what's going on. So, inshallah, do share it around. Uh, if I can mention just one thing as far as what people can do. Please, yes. Uh, one is through public shift, public opinion is shifting, uh, especially in America. And I would say on both sides, meaning on the right and on the left as well. So one of the things that we can do is continue to push that, uh, in other words, advocacy. Uh, each group on the right and the left have a sense of justice or they have their reasons for why opinion is now shifting. We can certainly push that along. And when opinion, public opinion shifts, then doors start to open. And when those doors start to open, then it becomes easier for us to send our assistance. So there are organizations, one of the questions I get commonly asked is people are under the misconception that nothing gets into Gaza. But things do get in, not in the quantity that they need to, but they still do. So if there's organizations out there that are helping the Gazans and you trust them, then send them money, send them resources, do what you can, because there are things getting in. Uh, so, for example, while we were there, UNRWA, the UN organization, although the U.S. has stopped its funding, we can still fund it. They have a website that you can donate from the United States, mm -hmm. from other parts of the world, and they they have the largest footprint over there, even from what we had seen. The World Central Kitchen that we had mentioned earlier, similarly, I had not seen anyone give out as much food as they were giving out. So we can certainly help them along as well. And then there's private organizations. As I mentioned, I went with GLIA. There's another organization that I was attached to as well called Humanity Auxilium, which also assists in food and medication uh, and in clinics. They, they have a website. Money can be given to them as well. Uh, and there's you know other organizations. There's, there's many of them at this point. And then finally, continue making dua. And and feeling for our Muslim brothers as as if they're and they are they are our brothers and sisters. 
Jazakum Allah khair. With that, we encourage everyone to, inshallah, do all three of those things excessively. Make a lot of dua, share what you can from your wealth, and also raise awareness, raise your voices. Jazakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.